In his research and travel in Africa, America and Britain, Jung absorbed mythological material and above all images to relate to his patients' dreams and the images of their unconscious. And everywhere he found evidence of the collective unconscious. Author Robert Johnson. He discovered it in the unconscious of his own patients and in his own extraordinary experiences of dreams and visions, and also in the mythology which fascinated him. The fact that mythology from every part of the world carries so many elements in common fascinated him. Well, there are certain myths that are timeless and universal, such as the hero myth, the, uh, the uh, trickster cycle, uh, of, uh, which you find among the American Indians or among African natives or in Australia or anywhere. These are on a primitive tribal level. But they can be found in the dreams of modern people just as well. And they are found in the Far East as well as in the Christian West. Uh, we think we are able to be born today and to live in no myth in, without history. That's, that's, that is a, a disease that's absolutely abnormal because man is not born every day. He's once born in, in a specific historical setting with the specific historical qualities, and therefore he's only complete when he has a relation to, to these things. But a myth is a story which to those who told it and who heard it um, was a believable story and, and a real event that actually took place. But it is in fact an exemplary story. It illustrates or exemplifies um, essential um, factors in human existence or it accounts for things like the creation of the world or of certain human situations but told in the form of a story. Mythology is not only tribal, foreign and primitive. The Arthurian legends survive in Britain, and when in England to see Godwin Baines, Jung and his wife made a point of visiting Glastonbury, one of the most evocative sites of Arthurian mythology. Count Nikolai Tolstoy. It is a British myth. It's the British, the matter of Britain, as they call it, but it was called the matter of Britain on a continent, and it um, has been accepted the world over. It's, you could almost call it the myth. And I suppose because it fulfills so many archetypal patterns. And Arthur, of course, is, is the archetypal king. He later became um, a figure who was believed to be sleeping beneath a mountain in a cavern surrounded by his knights to be called again in the hour of need. Well, there again, the, the idea of retiring into the heart of the mountain and living on there, as I'm sure, this descent back into the unconscious. Many visitors today are drawn to a site which has only vague mythological connections. Underneath Glastonbury Tor, legend has it that the Holy Grail is buried, the object of the constant quest of King Arthur and his knights. It is fascinating that these places draw people, and they don't just draw them because they're beautiful. I mean, the Tor is very striking, but it's the strikingness, I think, which is probably the key. It looks different, it feels different, and that's how it occurred to early peoples, and so they invested it with this numinous quality. Tintagel Castle in Cornwall is Arthur's supposed birthplace, where Merlin discovered the infant king to be washed up on the shore. In the case of Tintagel, there isn't really any um, very good evidence to link it to the story of Arthur. The fact is that people simply do invest these places with a numinous quality um, without knowing, and it's not necessary really, to know the true story of what lies behind it. In a sense, you can say the facts are dispensable. There must, one would suspect, be a need, and that is certainly the case with myth at all societies, certainly up until quite recently, uh, lived by myths, and we have our own maybe distorted myths, and, and where we don't have them, probably our state reflects that.
If you break up a tribe, they lose their religious ideas, the treasure of their old traditions, and they feel out of form completely. They lose their raison d'etre. All the meaning goes out of their life. It does not make sense anymore, because we infect them with our own insanity. Traditional tribal people understand the importance of retaining their religions and staying close to their myth. Jung recognized Mountain Lake's idea that the Pueblo Indians think with the heart as a source of psychological health. In eastern Arizona, the Navajo Indians have their reservation. Their religion is based on a system of healing ceremonies or chants intended to cure illness or to bring members of the tribe back into harmony with the tribal traditions. Sand paintings illustrate the stories and symbolism of tribal mythology, created by hand with naturally colored sands. Many Jungian psychologists have followed Jung's footsteps to visit the Indians of New Mexico and Arizona. For Donald Sandner, the interest is in the Navajos. For 15 years, he has studied their ceremonies and drawn certain parallels with Jungian psychology. You could say that in the Navajo system, there is a myth behind every chant, and there were, behind each chant, there, there was a story. And if you had a certain illness, for instance, let's say you had what they would call joint pain, swelling, arthritis, or rheumatism, that you would find, you would look for, you would say, what hero or what heroine, some of them are women, uh, the heroines of the story, uh, what heroine had that disease? And so you might say, ah, that I identify. You would be identifying already with her. So you would choose that chant. The chant is a recitation of part of one of the epic mythological stories about the gods and the early history of the tribe. And the sand paintings in the ceremony illustrate the story symbolically. But then the patient comes in and he identifies by sitting on some part of the sand painting. He identifies with that power in the sand painting. And uh, it would be roughly paralleling the myth, although the myth is not told, it's never told. It's assumed that you know it already. And that power is put on the patient. And at that moment, the patient takes it in. He identifies with the medicine man, with the, with the, with the uh, power in the painting, and with the hero or heroine of the whole chant. And he himself inwardly goes through that, uh, that process of being healed by that identification. <laughs> In the Navajo, they, they say that if the patient doesn't believe and actively, he has to not only believe, but actively concentrate on what's going on. The patient wanted to, want to get well, see. He wanted to get back on his feet, and and this was just what it is. So it's up, it's really it's up to the patient, you know. He has to the symbolism, the images have to enter his mind, and there activate that unconscious part of his mind, and he has to do that. And and in the in the Jungian analysis, also, it's the patient. If if there are no dreams, we can work with other things, but. 
the patient must produce the symbolism in order for it to be worked on. Some symbols recur in almost every sand painting. Lightning flashes, rainbows, and the warrior gods and star gods are the most common. They are found in many different cultures, and Jung recognized these symbolic strands as archetypes. The rich Navajo symbolism is not confined to healing chants and rituals. It is also used for the decoration of the Navajo arts and crafts. Zonny Jones weaves rugs which are replicas of the sand paintings and healing ceremonies. I mean, if you want the kind of a place to look for corroboration of a lot of Jung's views, particularly the ones about archetypes and the collective unconscious, you could do no better than to look into like the Navajo symbol system where it's all there. It's all put together from the collective unconscious. It's a traditional design handed down to me from my mother. There will be a sun and a moon here. I know what the finished rug will look like without having any plan of it on paper. There will be four gods like this one here. This is the lightning. And this is the rainbow around the edge. One symbol that appears constantly across cultures, in religion, mythology and dreams, is the serpent or snake. In uh, Navajo painting, the snake appears in a uh, great many of the chants. Almost, well, the great majority of them has a snake in it somewhere. And this is also true of people's dreams. In a lengthy analysis, there's almost always very important dreams that center around the snake. Once I, I have a patient, a young woman, about 20, 27 or 8, and her first words were when I had treated her, she said, you know, doctor, I come to you because I have a, a, a snake in my abdomen. I said, what? <laughs> yes, a snake. Uh, a black snake coiled up right in the, in, 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 in the bottom of my abdomen. And I must have made a rather uh, bewildered uh, face at her. And she said, you know, uh, I, I, I don't mean it literally, uh, <laughs> but uh, I should say it was a snake. It was a snake. <laughs> well, now, uh, that, is, that is a collective symbol. That yeah. is not a, an, in, an individual fantasy. That yeah. is a collective fantasy. A collective, yeah, that, I is, that is it. well known in India. Yeah. Well, she, she has nothing to do with India, but uh, we have it too, which was generally human. Uh, but it's entirely unknown. Yeah. So that I, even in the first moment, thought uh, perhaps she's crazy. But she was only highly intuitive. It, it is in India known, it is the, the, the basis of a whole philosophical system of tantrism. Uh, this is Kudalini. Yeah, Kudalini is uh, certain. I see. You see? And, uh, and that is something known to some few specialists. Uh, uh, generally, it's not known that we have a, a certain in, in the abdomen. Yeah. yeah. But that is a collective, you see? Yeah. That is a yeah. collective yeah. dream yeah. or a collective fantasy. Yeah. Well, the snake is one of the best uh, symbols of the unconscious itself because it seems so far away from human consciousness and feeling. <clears throat> it seems to have a, an autonomous life of its own, and therefore it, just, it inspires fear, but at the same time it inspires curiosity and a kind of uh, beauty that uh, relates it to the possibility of a sort of earth wis wisdom. So Jung thought it uh, represented the kind of lower nervous system, the spine and the, the, the lower parts of the brain stem. So that that was the snake, that, that deep, unconscious, cold, sort of inhuman power that governs us, even when we don't know it. The serpent is wise only because it doesn't close its eyes. You know, they have no eyelids so that they can't close their eyes. They seem to be uh, eternally awake and aware. And by projection, man might think that he could also acquire that kind of awareness. The symbol itself 
such as these things we've been talking about, these snakes, these animals, these uh, things you uh, dream about, have a power of their own that can be healing. Besides his travels and scholarly research, Jung's true work was the healing of his patients in his house on the lake at Kusnacht. Jung left no case notes of the patients he saw for analysis, but at the Jung Institute in Kusnacht, there is a large collection of the paintings which he encouraged his patients to produce, extending and illustrating the dream images of their unconscious. Michael Edwards is the curator of the archive. The clue to the healing or the, the way into the work was really through the imagination, and so he would encourage his patients to amplify and make more of um, their material because the unconscious seems to work in images. It's if that's the language of the unconscious and therefore for the person consciously to work with their images in a spontaneous way would put them in touch with themselves. Whether in single images produced by patients or whole series of paintings, Parallels with sand paintings and other mythological or religious images can be seen. The symbols individually have force, and the patient creates a mythological narrative in pictures. I think I have certainly learnt from Jung that the role of the image, even if it's an image as imagined, that it has an authority, that the image is not something simply in order to make a clever psychological diagnosis and then throw it away, but the image has power and value of its own. Jung believed, as I understand it, that the story was purposive, that it knew where it was going in its own way. It didn't follow a rational logic, but in the same way that a, a good novel uh, keeps us interested by taking twists and turns and yet uh, having a sense of being convincing about it. So these inner stories, these private stories, also I think um, had that same feeling of inevitability, which I think is archetypal. At his tower on the lake at Bowlingham, Jung produced images and mythological symbols as his patients did. He painted, sculpted, and carved the most important characters and images from his inner life. His travels had confirmed his views that in more primitive societies, myths and archetypes still had a force. In Europe, mythology was no longer a living influence. Dr. Gerhard Adler. Most of all, in his journey, both to the Pueblos and to the Gornis, he learned to look at the uh, Europeans America, Europeans, as, as a white man, we may say, as uh, from outside. And he saw that uh, this was quite, quite wrong to believe that the white man had all the truths. Today, the idea that man does not have all the truths or all the answers seems commonplace. Jung looked to man's lost psychic origins to restore some balance. However, some Jungian analysts now argue that we are still ruled by myth, but by a new myth, and we are unaware of the fact. Analyst James Hillman. Yes, the modern man had lost his myth, had lost his sense of myth. But you see, we've moved that, we've moved that. Now we realize that technology is our myth. The myth is always the thing you're in and don't know it's a myth. Mythology is always present. It's like asking, is matter present in, the, in today's world? Yes, of course. See, science is, uh, is man's current, current authority. It's, uh, it's the one thing that is, uh, is believable now. It's, uh, it's our reality, and uh, we can't escape that. A much more difficult thing to say and antagonistic to many ears is that science is our present myth. Science is our as if. Has science replaced religion in that sense? Yes. For most people, science is their religion. The same thing applies to science fiction. It's a modern mythology. 
And I think it's safe to say that science fiction, in, in all its various uh, forms and variations, does have one basic recurring theme. It's the theme of extraterrestrial intelligence in one form or another. There, it has a multitude of, of forms it can take, but that's the basic idea. And uh, that's highly significant uh, psychologically because it, it demonstrates that the, the second center of the psyche, the self, is all ready to be discovered. For San Francisco analyst John Beebe, the massive appeal of science fiction films like the Star Wars trilogy comes from combining the archetypal fantasy of extraterrestrial life with characters which represent our own contemporary culture. To me, the movie comes alive because it has so many of the elements of our culture all scattered around through it. The princess is a little bit like uh, a rather pert, but very nevertheless uh, uh, American uh, women's lib kind of kind of princess. And uh, then, of course, we have the uh, R2, D2, and uh, the butler uh, as a kind of Laurel and Hardy. And, of course, uh, we have uh, uh, the cowardly lion. And um, a young, uh, kind of uh, sparky, spanking clean young, uh, young hero uh, questing. Kind of, you have the wise old man. You have all these uh, loose archetypes of the culture to see myth as something that's happening all the time, that myths are being made all the time. So that it's sort of interesting when a movie becomes not a kind of uh, updated depiction of an old myth, but creates its own new myth. As we send our spacecraft beyond the solar system, carrying coded communications from the human planet. Perhaps science fiction expresses the idea that humankind cannot, after all, rely on the intellectual, conscious life alone. Special. Analyst James Hillman sums up Jung's travels as a way of learning, through first-hand experience, what the European psyche had allowed to become hidden. Remember, always Jung has a theory in his actions. And the theory was that the cultural overlay disguises archetypes more than it reveals them. That was part of what Jung was doing with his travels. And there's no, no doubt that it's, uh, you see things you don't see in our ordinary culture. Old Mountain Lake said to me, we are the people who live on the roof of the world. We are the sons of the sun who is our father. We help him daily to rise and to cross over the sky. We do this not only for ourselves, but for the Americans also. He correctly assumes that their day, their light, their consciousness, and their meaning will die when destroyed by the narrow-mindedness of American rationalism. And the same will happen to the whole world when subjected to such treatment. We've lost certain ancient myths or connection to the world as mythical, but we're still living myths. We can't, we can't ever step outside of a myth. We're in one now, we're in one in television as a myth. We're in one. And it carries us as we, whatever we're doing. And to de declare myth only something that people tell each other around the campfire, or dance naked to, or paint themselves purple, is not what, that's not the whole story of myth. Myth is what captures your imagination and moves your language and your body in, into doing th things in certain ways. So we're always in myth. In Africa, New Mexico, England and Switzerland, Jung's discovery of the collective unconscious unites humanity at an instinctual, mythical, imaginative level. What he intuitively knew and confirmed among African tribes and on a Pueblo rooftop, conscious life is constantly forgetting.
My dear friend, Mountain Lake, are your young men still worshipping the Father Son? I am busy exploring the truth in which Indians believe. It always impressed me as a great truth, but one hears so little about it. All you tell me about religion is good news to me. There are no interesting religious things over here, only remnants of old things. I was glad to hear that you are in better health than when I saw you. I'm sure your tribe needs you very much, and I wish that you will live still many years. As ever, your friend, C.G. Jung.